Welcome back to Newsmax Now. I'm Miranda Khan. And I'm John Bachman. A deadly brawl in Waco, Texas put a spotlight mm -hmm. on biker gangs in the United States. And joining us now to talk in depth about this is retired special agent Jay Dobbins. Dobbins was with the ATF when he infiltrated the notorious Hells Angel biker gang and has inside perspective on the biker culture. Thank you for being with us, Jay. Thanks for having me. All right, let's uh, take a look at what's going on right now. Nine people killed, more than a dozen injured in that mm -hmm. brawl, and hundreds of weapons recovered at the crime scene. And this is what Waco police are saying today. We would like it to be. We would ask there to be some type of truce between whatever motorcycle gangs are involved. We would encourage them to uh, try and be a little peaceful and uh, let the bloodshed stop. Sorry. Well, actually, that was a couple of days ago, but now we're looking at this. We're hearing reports about biker gangs putting out threats against local police officers. Mm -hmm. That's Sergeant Sergeant Swan. Is he living, though, in a fantasy world, Jay, when he's telling these biker gangs to stand down? I think Sergeant Swan has done a wonderful job of educating all of us about the progress of the investigation and the status, but these guys don't negotiate. They, I, I think asking them for consideration is going to fall on deaf ears. So what can they expect? Because, you know, right now, what, they had 170 of these individuals arrested. Mm -hmm. What Realistically, what can we expect? Because we're hearing reports that this is actually a much bigger and more widespread, widespread problem, rather, than any of us realized until now. Yeah, I think that these guys are capable of carrying out the threats that they've issued. I think it's a very brazen move to threaten law enforcement officers. But these guys live by a different code than the rest of us do in society. The fact that uniform law enforcement officers were present before this even broke bad at the Twin Peaks is a demonstration that they don't care about what any of us think or about society's laws or rules. And also today, Jay, there's a new angle of the story, and we talked about this at the onset here. The Texas Department of Public Safety confirming to Newsmax that there is a bulletin out there, and they're not saying exactly what's in this bulletin, but other outlets are reporting, including CNN, that members of these biker gangs uh, who are also in the military are supplying these gangs with grenades and C4 explosives to attack police. I want to ask your, your perspective on this, since you know these groups very well. How credible do you think that type of information is? Do you think that's really happening? I think the information is entirely credible. Mm. I think these guys have access. I know they have access to that type of weaponry, explosives, improvised explosive devices, assault weapons, and large they... caliber firearms. And they don't mess around. You don't negotiate with these guys. They don't forgive and they do not forget. And are they getting it from the military? I think the military is a common source for that. Um, really? There's biker gang members who have previous military experience, have associates in the military. I can't say with any credibility or validation that that is the source of those items, but it's a common source, and these guys have connections into that arena. Jay, I want to get your, your perspective on this. How widespread of a problem is this, and what is the appeal to join these biker gangs? The problem with the criminal gangs is widespread. I think the criminal outlaw gangs taint the entire biker community because most people that ride motorcycles, most people that ride in clubs are law-abiding citizens and they uh, ride for the romantic element of being on a motorcycle. And there's nothing wrong with that, I encourage that. But these biker gangs that just live on violence and intimidation and drug trafficking and murder and rape and extortion. But Jay, As society, I, we look at all of them under the same umbrella, and that's not really the case. Jay, also, when you look at other reports about this, these biker gangs are, are described in some ways as the only uh, international kind of uh, white-collar crime groups, even though they don't wear traditional suits like the Mafia did. But are they, have they taken what the Mafia maybe did in the 60s and 70s and taken that to an international level? Absolutely, yes. The biker criminal gangs are international crime syndicates. You look at the Banditos, you look at the Hells Angels. They're all over the world. Tens of thousands of members. Uh, the Hells Angels, which I am most familiar with, they're on six different continents. The only one they're not on is Antarctica, and probably the only reason is because motorcycles don't run at 50 degrees below zero. So, yeah, I mean, I think the thing that, that stood out to me, and you said this is a widespread problem, obviously you're talking about the different countries, but I mean, it, here in the U.S., I mean, 
you don't hear about these stories all the time, and we've been in news in a long time. I mean, in Texas, is this all over the country? It is, and I think as a society, we're shocked by what we saw at the Twin Peaks in Waco. Um, even in law enforcement, to some extent, people are shocked by that. But it happens all the time. Maybe not to that scale, with that many people involved, or in public venue, but we go back to the Laughlin riots with the Hells Angels and the Mongols in 2002. Mm -hmm. They shot it out and killed each other under the watchful eye of 150 casino cameras. Yeah, obviously not concerned about the surveillance. And Jay, we want you to stick around. We're going to talk uh, more directly about your book and your story and how you were able to infiltrate the Hells Angels when we come right back from this commercial break. Jay Dobbins is sticking around. And welcome back to Newsmax Now. I'm Miranda Khan along with John Bachman and we're joined again by Jay Dobbins, retired special agent with the ATF. And Jay, uh, we want to talk a little bit now about your experience going undercover. It's, it sounds extremely fascinating. You went undercover with the Hells Angels. What was that like? It was a crazy ride. It was two years spent with those guys in 2001 through 2003 in the western, southwestern United States. And we were constantly in violent situations and looking for violent situations similar to what we saw in Waco. Jay, what is the motivation of these biker gangs from what you saw? Is it money? Is it power? Is it uh, fame to a certain extent? What are they looking for? What drives them? I think you hit on all of them. I think it's control of territory. It's money. It's power. It's influence. It's intimidation. Uh, notoriety. Um, they're very... Uh, overt about how they conduct themselves. They're criminal organizations, but they advertise with their patch on their back. Yeah, and, and when you are infiltrating a group like this, you have the person that you are, Jay Dobbins, but you also had Jay Bird, which was your uh, al you know, alternative personality. How do you maintain, I always wondered this from somebody who has gone undercover, how do you maintain your, your double self life, right? and the double life? Yeah. I wish I would have done a better job of it. I lost myself in the case to some extent. I created a huge amount of battle damage on my family and on my friends. Um, I became consumed with the role that I was in, but I almost had to because playing that role with the Hells Angels who are the king of the mountain, it's not something that I was able to dabble in. I couldn't treat it as a hobby. It wasn't something that I started doing at eight in the morning and uh, left at the office at five in the afternoon. What do you mean, though, you, you lost yourself? Are you saying that it was you were struggling to find who you were or that you had a difficult time maintaining your real life because you were so involved? A, yeah, I had a real difficult time uh, not bringing my role home. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was acting at home a lot like I was when I was uh, undercover during the case. And that's very difficult and very unfair to the families who support people, agents, officers, who do the work that I did. Your operation was called Black Biscuit. What was the meaning behind that name? Well, our case agent was a huge hockey fan. So Black Biscuit yeah, the was puck. the term for a hockey puck. And he tried to pick a name that was so obscure because we were so secretive about the operation, he didn't want anybody stumbling into what we were doing accidentally. Was it intoxicating for you at some point, Jay, to be with these group of guys? Did you actually see what would draw somebody to this lifestyle? Yeah, sure. It's, uh, it's rough, it's exciting, it's dangerous, it's risky, um, even more so when you're pretending to be that person and faking that you're uh, a criminal in the presence of really hardcore criminals that if and when they find out who you are, the consequences, you know, will be fatal. But they didn't find out who you are. How were ultimately, you, ultimately they did, but how were you able to get out of that? Well, our case ended with a massive amount of arrests, uh, indictments. Ultimately, uh, my true identity was revealed through the court process. And like these officers in Texas are receiving threats from these guys, so did I. I, I still have active contracts on me. I'm not sure that anybody wants to fill them at this point because there's been so much publicity around my case and my infiltration. I don't think there's any upside to it, but 
I've had murder contracts still active, threats to kidnap and torture my kids, threats to gang rape the uh, videotape the gang rape of my wife. My house was burned to the ground with everything I owned inside it in 2008. Um, these guys, they have their PhDs in violence and intimidation. There's no one better at it. So how do you live your life yeah. day by day knowing that you're a target, your whole family is a target? I live with concern. I've seen firsthand what they're capable of. I know what they are able to do. I don't live in fear because as soon as I do that, as soon as they scare me, as soon as they chase me underground, they've won. And I wasn't the bad guy here. I wasn't the guy raping and murdering and selling drugs and selling guns. I was the federal agent who was trying to expose the violence and document it and report it out. And so, yeah, I'm concerned with the threats and what they're capable of, but I live my life. I don't want a problem. I'm not looking for a problem. I'll walk away from a problem. But if they corner me or bring it to me and my family, I will surely resolve the problem. Well, it's one hell of a story, Jay, and we appreciate you being with us here today. And we'll check back in with you because we know this story in Waco is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this issue. We'd love to have you back again. You can read more about Jay's own story in his book, No Angel, My Harrowing Undercover Journey into the Inner Circle of the Hells Angels. It's a New York Times bestseller. Please do check it out. Special thanks to Jay Dobbins for being thanks. around with us. And a special thanks to our producer, AJ, for excellent work setting up this interview. It was a pleasure to speak with you, Jay. Still a lot more to come here on Newsmax now. We're going to have the very latest on the Duggar family. This is just, a, you know, I normally don't like to overuse that term, shocking story, but this, this is a shocking story. What now in this case?